All righty. In session, correspondent Beth Karras and criminal defense attorney Jason Lamb, both in Phoenix right now, watching all of this unfold, and did so yesterday. Uh, Jason, we heard the defense team there say that an appeal is being planned. On what grounds do you think an appeal would be acceptable in this case? Well, Christy, appeals of criminal convictions to higher courts are based on legal errors. For example, the judge let in inadmissible evidence. Uh, there was some decision, for example, we talked about the 703 allegation uh, that could send Tammy to prison for one to three years. Those are legal issues. Those are the kinds of things that appellate courts will hear on a direct appeal. Factual issues, findings of the jury, that never, almost never, succeeds on appeal. Typically, appellate courts across the country uh, will have a standard line, which is, we will not disturb the factual findings of the jury or trial court unless they're clearly erroneous. In this case, you had eight people. They agreed unanimously. Uh, there was some evidence to support it. Um, and, and at this point, I would never see an appeal uh, based on the facts. Could they raise some legal issues? Sure. But by and large, it was a pretty clean trial uh, we'll just have to see what Tammy's defense team comes up with down the line. Jason, I know you you kind of explained it already, but for folks just joining us, I, I want them to be very clear. You mentioned the 703. Can, can you kind of walk us through what that is and how it applies here? Sure. In Arizona and many other states, your first conviction is going to be probation eligible, assuming there's no weapons or no um, you know, injuries to small children, things of that nature. Remember, Baby Gabriel's fate and whereabouts really don't come into play because Tammy was charged with forgery and the custodial interference. What the prosecution did, they filed an allegation, a penalty enhancement to say that if she's convicted on the first count, that will be a predicate prior or a prior conviction for the second count such that the second count will be treated as a repetitive offense with prison being mandatory. Well, the defense challenged that early in the case and they said that well, wait a minute, the forgery is the uh, conspiracy because in Arizona, you need to have an overt act in furtherance of the conspiracy. The law is a little bit different here. And they said the forgery is that overt act. Ultimately, what happened is when the judge instructed the jury, the judge said that one cannot interfere or conspire to interfere with custodial rights until paternity was established. That happened on December 17th. That's when Logan's legal paternity was established. December 14th, just three days earlier, is when the forgery occurred. That was the document filed in court that had Logan McQuarrie or John Doe. So the way that it all played out is that there are two different date ranges, uh, the December 14th as a discrete date, and then December 17th onward. And the jury had to find that the overt act in furtherance of the conspiracy occurred after December 17th. And as we all heard the evidence, there were any number of things that happened. For example, the call that was recorded with Craig Cherry when she told him to lie to the police. That could be an overt act, quite simply. In any case, now that we have two different discrete time frames, we have two discrete prior convictions, what will happen ultimately is that she can get probation on the first, but the second one will be treated as a repetitive offense and Tammy Smith should be going to prison on that second count. Okay, gotcha. Uh, Beth Karras, let me ask you, because this is far from over, and, and especially since nobody knows where baby Gabriel is, 